Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop here in Southwest Florida. My name is Christine, and today I'm here with John and Rob. And today the story that we're reading is one that Rob picked out. It's called Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf, and Rob is going to read a section from that story for us. Andrews couldn't get to the bank until just before it closed, so of course the line was endless, and he got stuck behind two women whose loud, stupid conversation put him in a murderous temper. He was never in the best of tempers anyway, Anders, a book critic known for the weary, elegant savagery with which he dispatched almost everything he reviewed. With the line still doubled around the rope, one of the tellers stuck a position close sign in her window and walked to the back of the bank, where she leaned against the desk and began to pass the time with a man shuffling papers. The woman in front of Anders broke off their conversation and watched the teller with hatred. Oh, that's nice, one of them said. She turned to Anders and added, confident of his accord, one of those little human touches that keep us coming back for more. Anders had conceived his own towering hatred of the teller, but he immediately turned it on the presumptuously cryberry in front of him. Damned unfair, he said. Tragic, really. If they're not chopping off the wrong leg or or bombing your ancestral village, they're closing their positions. She stood her ground. I didn't say it was tragic, she said. I just think it's a pretty lousy way to treat your customers. Unforgivable, Anders said. Heaven will take note. She sucked in her cheeks, but stared past him and said nothing. Anders saw that the other woman, her friend, was looking in the same direction. And then the teller stopped what they were doing, and the customer slowly turned around, and silence came over the bank. Two men wearing black ski masks and blue business suits were standing to the side of the door. One of them had a pistol pressed against the guard's neck. The guard's eyes were closed and his lips were moving. The other man had a sawed-off shotgun. Keep your big mouth shut, the man with the pistol said, though no one had spoken a word. One of you tellers sits the alarm, you're all dead meat. Got it? The tellers nodded. Well, go ahead and start by telling us why you picked this story. Um, It's really quick, and uh, the action, you know what's going to happen by the title. And I was curious what you guys thought about the title, if you like kind of knowing what's going to happen before you read the first part. And I thought it was cool. I didn't really see that a lot of other places. I thought you picked this one because it's about a critic getting shot in the head. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, I wonder if that's why you wrote it that way. But it it does a lot more about writing and uh, criticism and all that. I thought Bullet in the Brain as a title, though, could have gone a lot of ways. And I'm pretty bad about like reading a title and keeping it in mind as I go through a story. For me, I usually kind of finish a piece and then go back and refer to the title. And that's kind of when it all coalesces for me. In this case, uh, Bullet in the Brain could have been something like shooting yourself in the foot almost. I think for me, the tensest part was just this confrontation in a public place with a character that you kind of hate, but um, at the same time, you kind of want to see him stick it to these women who are being rude. And then like, by the time he was shot, I was smiling. And I don't know why. It was a weird payoff. Yeah, it's a bit of a comedy, I think, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bullet in the, the title, it could be metaphorical. It doesn't have to be literal. Right. So it didn't really give it away for me. I think I already knew that he was going to get shot, so maybe that's what gave it away. And initially, before I read the story, I already knew how it was going to end. Yeah, if you have an idea um, what the ending is. I think there's something, too, to be said about the fact that this is a short story, and yet our character was shot and killed a little less than halfway through. And so he's dead halfway through, and yet we still have all of this story left. It should be boring by that point. You've kind of given it away. And yet some of the best parts of this piece come after the fact. And when the bullet is actually tearing through his brain, what he's not remembering. And then when we land on that very nice uh, sort of final memory. And I thought it also could have been a little overdone if he had said something different with some of those final graphs. Rather than saying he did not think about, he did not think about. I think maybe a less experienced writer might have drawn that out and said that the character did think about those things. And it might have ended up... Um, a little overdone or a little trite and maybe really made that moment seem like it's everything you expect it to be when you're told that your life is going to flash before your eyes. And I love that he ended on this scene that uh, might seem kind of simple um, on the baseball field, but for this man, this this main character who's a cynic and a critic, it really does sound like the last time he was truly happy. Yeah, the, absolutely. He has great sentences too. I think that's um, what I noticed by just reading it first. It's really long and there's a lot going on, but it's fun and pretty easy to read. So, Yeah, he's got a real command on the English language here, obviously, and there's no word that's overused. There's no word that I would swap for another word. I love too how he just kind of lays the character out in that first paragraph. He describes him as a cynic who addresses everyone with this weary savagery, he calls it. And you can just tell that this is a character that's exhausted by everyone. Yeah. This line in the last paragraph, speaking of the bullet, he says, in the end, it will do its work and leave the troubled skull behind, dragging its comet tail of memory 
memory and hope and talent and love into the Marble Hall of Commerce. That's a beautiful, beautiful line. Yeah, you can really spin it. Yeah, he's good. And again, I, I think maybe a, a less experienced writer might have ended this story with the bullet somehow or with the shooting. And then to kind of leave the character in this place that he's only really taking in again for the first time in that moment when the bank robber has the gun pressed up under his chin and he's forced to kind of look toward the sculptures at the ceiling. And the narrator here, the writer, is is leaving this character in this place that he's not all that familiar with, but this is where the buck stops for him. I think it could have ended this story maybe even before the last paragraph. With Without it? Yeah, the second to last paragraph when he goes and takes the field and he's in a he's in a trance repeating them to himself. Well that's where his original love is revealed. Right? Yeah. But it would have been nice to see him just have a nice abrupt ending. But I, I like this ending too. It's awesome. I find that sometimes in the stuff I write, I'm like, all right, I could have two endings here. Which one do I pick? That's right. Yeah, it's killing your darlings. Yeah, because it's part of it. these are both great. Yeah. I don't know. Then again, maybe I'm just kind of in love with these lines at the end. Not the the bit about the bullet tearing through the brain, but the way he describes the field and the shadows lengthening on the field as he, you know, puts his fist into his leather mitt over and over. Well, yeah, that. I mean, I think that's why that second, the the final paragraph is the final paragraph, is because it gives him. It's about time. Time, time to to hang out and enjoy what he used to enjoy way back in a autumn day. And I think even up until then, he's still describing that moment where the bullet is passing through the brain. Um, we've been in that that second or that moment all the way up until this last paragraph. And I think that takes a lot of effort. Um, do you guys remember one of the last stories we read, The Midnight Zone by Lauren Groff? Mm-hmm. I went and bought that book and tore through it in like two days. That was it good? So good. But she has these scenes where she describes hurricanes and she describes them slowly. Instead of just saying like the hurricane tore through, she describes what might have been like a a 30 minute thing for pages and pages. And it's not so much a run on sentence, but there's the sense that um, the words are all kind of like tumbling together kind of rushing out. And there's something uh, really expertly done if you can draw that out without boring your reader because it was all really interesting. And I felt like that was what he was doing with those last like five paragraphs. Just enjoying himself. Yeah. Yeah, but I wasn't bored. No, absolutely not. It's an the story's fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it wasn't indulgent. Um, this one just like took such a turn for me because I wasn't expecting, I wasn't expecting him to necessarily get shot. Yeah, I wish I didn't know that he was going to get shot. For some reason, the first time I heard about it, like, yep, but the guy gets killed. I think the title did linger in my head. So when he was being uh, the cri- his critical self with these these bank robbers. Yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, it was hilarious. But I kind of was like, oh, he's going to push them too far. Yeah. And that's where the title comes from. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I, so I'm waiting for it i didn't know before i started reading but you know you can tell like this guy's not long for this this situation which feels kind of punchline-y which mm-hmm. i really like yeah oh, that's why the bullet in the brain all right well what else do you guys want to say about this one i wanted to say something about the first line sure there's um yeah that's good there's one. an art for for first lines right is and this that, isn't sorry there's an art or an arc oh an art yeah, yeah. an art <laughs> yeah um uh, for first lines and how do you get the reader to just instantly invest and this isn't like the greatest first line in the world but it is definitely one that draws you in you know anders couldn't get to the bank until just before it closed so of course the line was endless and he got stuck behind two women with whose loud stupid conversation put him in a murderous temper i think you know he's you're setting up or the the author's setting up immediate conflict um and immediate character so you you get this uh i mean that line that the phrase of course the line was endless right um is his thoughts you know he's I don't know, it just gets you right into the head and the headspace of the character, like immediately, and into a uh, a situation that's it's not the main conflict of the story, but it is conflict that we can we can relate to and get invested in. So I thought it was a great example for a first line. I thought too, like the perspective for this one, the, the point of view for this one is great, right? It's like this close third. So it's like you said, he's describing that scene at the bank, of course, like that's what Anders would think. But oh, yeah. but by the end it's the narrator that's like close to Anders describing his death. It's not as if Anders... I don't think this would have worked, I guess, was what I'm saying, had this been first person and Anders had this, like, oh, this is flashing before my eyes. No. I think... And I think why that is maybe for him is because he's like not necessarily like a sympathetic character. He's not a likable character. 
right? He's he's kind of a jerk. Yeah, he's a dick. Yeah. But this third person point of view is able to show us what maybe he wouldn't ever articulate. So oh, we get to go point. into his brain and see that he has this treasured memory of a simpler time when he had that same inkling to <laughs> criticize the kid for the way he was talking, but instead it like he loved it for some reason. Yeah, the narrator gives the gives uh, Wolf the chance to pull back because there's this it is worth noting what ambers did not remember given what he did remember and we haven't been told what he did remember yet um this is like a delaying tactic but um to you know elevate suspense for what is the memory that's gonna that he's gonna end with but uh he and then it goes through he did not remember this and you couldn't get that sort of thing like you said from a first person perspective yeah mm-hmm. and, the, and the fact that the narrator can pull back from from anders and uh and comment on on him as a person more than having to rely on his immediate sensations gives him that space to do it right do you guys ever like write something and then change the point of view or do you always just go with what you started i think with? i've done that have you well i think point of view is more fluid than people give it credit for being what meaning point you, of view you can change it yeah well it's it there's a continuum you can work along which um, I, I talk about in the workshop all the time is psychic distance right i mean that's exactly what he's doing here he's going in and out of ander's head he has a a, a wide field psychic distance where he, we're not in his head he has a narrow field or right in his head and literally in a certain case it's not ander's sensation but it's inside of his brain right and nobody <laughs> in that room knows what's ha- how that bullet traveled through it's not it's not even if uh they bother to do a, a postmortem you know, like a week later and try to figure out the trajectory of the brain and yeah the doctor's not gonna be that close attention so there's nobody in the universe who knows what happened to that bullet in his brain except for this narrator so that's definitely moving in and out of sure. what we what, where we're where we're, our perspective is from and i think you know if we we get too caught up on the idea that third person limited has to be limited to that that person it doesn't it can pull back it can go in and it does all the time you know that's what uh the difference between summarizing and dramatizing often is is we're pulling back from the psychic distance like sure. later that week so and so walked down to the store yeah we're not, not in his head on that walk but in the next sentence we can dive into his head and say yeah. he saw a little boy crossing the road well that's the difference between um showing some in real time and like it's not documentary because it's third person it's it's a story because we're choosing like you said when to to be in that person's head i guess i asked that because i wonder i always wonder when someone writes something so expertly like this if they considered the options for perspective but i also get the sense that like some of these writers just have like such control that they i I bet when this guy started writing that he just that was just the perspective he chose i don't know yeah you write enough and you read enough and you just kind of get a feel for it but i i I do think that a lot of writers probably think about it more than we realize yeah Uh, there's a book i started in the third person went to first person switched back again went back to first person finally settled in so (laughs) it's way too much work for me yeah well if i write it in first person that's how it's going to be forever but you might have just a feeling beforehand. Like, yeah. You don't have to necessarily analyze it, but you just feel like this story needs to be in this person. I think it's kind of worth noting, too, that like I read this a couple times before we discussed it today, and I don't even remember like some of the memories that he skips through. I, mem- I remember like him mentioning like a wife or an ex-wife and, and a daughter, but, but just like he said, he didn't remember these. Like Those don't stick out, and I guess they're only there to serve as a comparison because for a lot of folks... Your wife and your kids and your accomplishments might be what you think flashes before your eyes. I hope that's not the case. <laughs> Rob <laughs> wants to remember baseball. We know that. Sounds like a pretty good way to go out. Yeah. The uh, the details in the story are great. The just kind of a critic walk. Like if I were to tell you the story in an elevator, you'd be like, "That's a you know, that's a good. This just has a good plot, you know. Oh yeah. For what it's for what it, for what plot there is, it's a good idea. Guy walks in, has to stare at a painting, then he gets killed. All right. <laughs> he's snarky <laughs> about yeah. it he's like this is how you rob a bank come on guys it makes me think like how we um as writers treat our characters and if we're willing to do stuff like this to them i like doing it what like putting them in a yeah, situation just, like be like this is the way stuff happens first because sometimes it's easy to think um i'm gonna protect you because you're my character it's just you don't even think that you just do it naturally i think so to see someone have it in for someone not have it in but just allow it to happen is uh, instructive, I guess. This yeah. is one of those like it's a he's like a classic clown. By by pushing the boundaries, he's like forcing people to be to reveal themselves, right? Yeah, he's teasing it out of them. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's funny, I think, is because he's mm-hmm. pushing those boundaries in in a great way, and then the the people just they shoot him in the head because that's who they are. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's like a lot of the advice though that I feel like I've read when it comes to novels, like when you don't know how to keep writing something or to make it go on and on and then bring it back. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. So they always tell you to like put your character into more and more trouble. Yeah, back them into corners. I was thinking about that a couple of days ago, just about like TV writing, like constantly new conflict. And I guess that yeah. applies one way or the other to this, right? Well, yeah, it's it's the reason why we can watch like five series or five seasons of a series. Yeah, you're not kidding, jeez. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't it doesn't ever stop. There's no. always a problem. Sometimes it's exhausting, but for the sake of a short story, it's like it. This is for this one, it's everything. Yeah, I also think there's a little bit of wish fulfillment here. Yeah. He's writing about a critic. Oh, yeah. After all. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, critic. Yeah. I wonder how that played, like, when it came out, if people said something. They're like, point taken, Tobias. Well, I guess this is how we like to bring it back, though. What is it from this story that you guys think we could lift and steal and copy to improve our own writing? Keep the action high. Keep the tension high. One way or the other. Even if your story's not, nothing like happening dramatic, you got to do it some way. That's a good point. Instead of delaying it or thinking that the reader is patient about it yeah exactly yeah i i also think letting the character be who the character is you know because there's there's a person who could say no one would act like that in that situation well no shit like, it's a good story this guy would <laughs> like the story's about this guy and that's what he did in right. that situation um so don't worry too much about that like you're depicting a real yeah, character this isn't journalism that reminds me of the one that i shared uh the last time we got together which was the guy that kept lying about his child yeah, that being was a great sick. Story. Yeah, so I feel like a certain reader, like my mother, would read that and go, "No, no, no! What are you doing?" But she doesn't realize that it's for the most people, it's thrilling to read something that you either wouldn't do or couldn't fathom, or but so true to his character. I guess what I would take away from it is what you were kind of saying, like that third person doesn't have to be contained. And I think that we all kind of have that inkling, like you said, to like do it without even noticing. But to read it done like so expertly here, it's like, okay, th there's something legitimate to what I'm toying with when I write something in third person, but then say something direct like Anders is a is a book critic known for this and this and this. And just lay it out there. Yeah, we get caught up so much in that tell show thing. And we talked about this in there and uh, the workshop where we try to show things that really don't need to be shown. You no, just you just want to hear it. Yeah. yeah. I'd also, this would, I could use this as an example, as a, a great first line and how it establishes uh, energy for the story, right. uh, drawing the reader in. So that's another thing I could pull from this. Yeah, it's like that action background conflict development thing. Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that, um, you know, people think I have to start with action, so they start with the inciting the incident, yeah. the right. in action. Whereas you don't have to, you just start with action that establishes who the character is. Right. And then the inciting incident forces him to act in some way, um, like make choices. But this, uh, the the conflict that's in this first sentence is uh, is all about him without being all about the story. If that right. makes sense. Yeah. I hate being late personally. Like it's like an anxiety thing. It oh, puts yeah. me in a piss. So like, yeah, I get pissed. So I'm just like, all right, don't be late. So yeah, we can relate to that immediately. <laughs> that's true. Fucking hate being late. <laughs> okay. Cool. I guess that's good for this one, huh? Mm-hmm.